Welcome to Coffee Is Dot Me podcast, where me means you, or more precisely, us. This is the show where your host, Valerian, without using any interrogation techniques, convinces coffee professionals to reveal their secrets to teach and inspire you to make better coffee and earn a few bucks on the side, if that's what you fancy. Let the show begin. Hey, Coffee Is Me uh, listeners, thank you for tuning in again to the second part of our podcast. I'm your host, Valerian Rala, and I'm having today the possibly youngest entrepreneur, coffee entrepreneur I know. Welcome, Frankie. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. With Frankie, obviously, is also her dad, Tim. He talked about his coffee brands in the last episode, so definitely check them out if you didn't, because it all kind of ties up. So, Frankie, first of all, how old are you? I'm 14 years old. When did you start to do coffee? Um, I started coffee when I was in sixth. I was about 12 years old, so sixth grade. And I started coffee because my dad um, bought a coffee company, Shul. And I just started spending a lot of time there uh, helping out in the retail shop. And so, and then I, one day I just did a cupping uh, for fun and I really enjoyed it and I kept doing a lot of cuppings and that kind of started me into um, focusing on like specialty coffee and actually enjoying like black coffee and uh, quality coffee. This question should be easier for you than uh, for my other people on the podcast. Do you remember your first sip of coffee? Uh, yes, I do. When I was 11 years old. Uh, I think, yeah, that's close enough, 11 or 10. I was at Shul, um, and I remember we have these self-serve pots at Shul where you can, um, where it has like four different um, coffees. One is like flavored and the other are single origin or blends. And then you just can pour your own coffee however much you want in a cup. And so I got like a tiny mini uh, tasting cup and I poured a tiny bit of coffee in it, and then I added uh, some cream and sugar because I wanted to try the coffee, but I didn't think I would like it black. So I just had a little bit of extra stuff in it, and um, and I remember liking it, and then later trying it black and also liking it. So yeah. How old were you? Sorry. Um, probably ten or eleven. Okay, nice. Okay, there you go. Much better than your dad, who had his his first coffee on a date when he was twenty one. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Just for full transparency, we all met. It was when I was helping out at Boot for the EQ grader class. Yes. And I first time when I saw you, I was like, oh, this guy is having a trip to, meaning your dad, having a trip to San Francisco with his daughter. And, you know, she's kind of cute with him, kind of a good, nice, you know, dad and daughter team while the dad is taking the cue. But you were also doing the queue, right? Yes, I was. I was I was really excited about it because we had heard about it from another Q grader um, who we had actually hired to help us at Shul because we had no Q graders at Shul. And he told us about the Q course. And I thought that was something that if it was available to us, that would be a really fun thing to do. And we ended up having the opportunity to do it. Well, first of all, I apologize to misjudge you. I never thought uh, that, I think you were 12 at that time? Mm, I think I, well, 12 or 13. You're 12. 12, okay, yeah. And then I turned, I got my Q certificate on my 13th birthday. That's, that's fun fact. Oh, that's, you know, I was... I was shocked. I did a Q a few months before you guys, and it's very hard. You know, I'm in the industry from 2002. Taking the Q for me was more a challenge. You know, I'm not a big believer in certificates, but it was a ama it's amazing challenge to see whether your taste palettes are there, whether you can really pass this hard exam. In a first my my first class, I failed, missed one class, and that's what happened to you too, right? You mi failed basically mm -hmm. on one test. And which yeah. one was that? Uh, I failed one of the cuppings. I think it was the Asia cupping with all of the Asian coffees. And I think I I remember that I um, I was less sensitive to the uh, the defect that kind of smelled like gasoline. I'm forgetting the name. Phenol. Just 
Yes, exactly. You know, and so I was less sensitive to that and I was struggling with picking that up. So I didn't end up getting it in the, um, in that coupling, but then I retook it later and was able to get it. So we are keen souls because I did exactly the same. Like it was the yeah, Asia exactly. cup cupping. I didn't pick up the phenol. I never had a problem with the picking up the phenol. The thing is, it's a hard exam. Every day mm -hmm. you have multiple, multiple exams. Asia cupping is one of the last ones, if not the last cup. I think, yeah, it's the last cupping just before the theory exam. And you are tired. You are seriously freaking tired. So I just missed that cup. I went back. I was like, oh, yeah, there it is. And there is no, you cannot fix that. I mean, you can only, only do one cupping. So you have to retake it. Well, thank you so much. I It was a really fun experience. And uh, my main the main thing that I was most excited about was just that I learned a lot more about coffee in that week and it really improved my skills just doing the tests and everything um, as a Q grader. So. Yeah, and it also humbled. For me, it humbled me a lot. You know, I already had two coffee companies, you know, I was cupping, selecting coffees, you know, evaluating them, but then you go to the queue and you get these slaps. It's like, oh yeah, it's you are still learning. Just chill, you know, don't be cocky here, right? Exactly, exactly. So how does it feel to be the youngest Q-grader on the world? It, I mean, it feels great to know that you are, I guess, the best at something. But also, I think that it, I really hope that a lot more young people want to do it and find interest in it because that's kind of, that's something that's exciting. And I think that a lot of young people can really enjoy doing as well as I have enjoyed doing it. Um, and also that, like Hoven, it, that's not the main point of Hoven, that I'm the youngest Q grader. I, that's really cool that I am a Q grader and that I can use those skills to like help. But um, I guess, I mean, it's really exciting for me, but also I don't want to like have the main focus on that. I'd like to use that to do something else, you know? Mm -hmm. Did you get some uh, credits with your friends or classmates that you are a Q grader? Um, some of my friends like to hype me up and stuff like that. <laughs> they'll, they'll um, or some, I mean, Sometimes at school, um, like some of my teachers will come up to me in the hallways or in class and they'll talk to me about it. So that's pretty cool that it's kind of a, and people will congratulate me on it. But um, so that's really exciting. Were any of the uh, tests something you, you were like, oh, this is really awesome? I really, I really enjoyed doing the cuppings, even though they were kind of stressful because they were tests, obviously, and you know, you're being graded in that. This depends on if you're going to get your certificate or not. Um, I just thought it was really cool to taste all the coffees because they had some really good coffees there when we were, and you know that, And but <laughs> there were some really good coffees there when we were there. And um, I guess those were really exciting. And also just outside of the tests in the morning, they'd always, there'd always be coffee ready uh, when you got there. And I just loved having the coffee, the good coffee, and then also the conversation of the other um, people at the Q course trying that also were there to learn a lot about coffee and also knew a lot about coffee so that you could just kind of talk about coffee with them. And that's like, and they really enjoyed to talk about that. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I have to say, I, that's why I assist. I do it for free. I do it as a, as a hobby to help out on the Q uh, courses for boot because I can meet you guys. And it's always a great group of people with amazing stories. And it, it just, you know, it's just fun. You know, I really liked when I was doing my Q, you know, the aroma set is always available in a lab, so I can go and do it anytime, but I never did it for some reason. And I had so much fun with the aroma set. I realized that I'm a person who loves to smell things. I love, for example, if I land in San Francisco, and let's say I go for holidays, I always smell California. I always say that California has its own smell. It's, I just love smelling. So for me, the, the aroma sets were something which I enjoyed a lot. Yeah, I, I remember enjoying those a lot, too, when we actually had the opportunity to practice those at our house. And I just I think we, we also had a lot of fun um, practicing those because when we at the beginning, when we didn't know anything, we just kind of blind smelled them and then we'd get them like way wrong. But it was just a really fun experience to practice those and to kind of train our noses for that. Awesome. Uh, do you have any tips for Q graders who are just studying or preparing for exams? Yeah, I would say that one of the best things you can do is just practice cupping coffee a lot. Um, just any coffees that you have around, you can practice cupping them and just try to pick out specific flavors and that'll help you 
later to um, be able to score well. And if you just have a little practice, even if you don't really know how to score or anything like that, um, it just helps to have a little experience in tasting coffees a lot. Uh, also, I would say the hardest test is definitely, or for a lot of people, I don't know if this is the hardest test for everyone, um, is the solutions test where there are solutions of water and there's a different amount of like saltiness, sweetness, and sour in those solutions. And you have to like tell how much of each there is. I think that's the most difficult one. And I would say that a good thing to practice before would be maybe just, just mix a little bit of sugar and salt or citric acid in some water and see if you can kind of tell how much is in it because I mean, that is, that's difficult and it's hard to prepare for, but it could help later. And also the smells is another one that's a good one to prepare for. If I can add to that from my, and I agree totally with you, those are all great. Maybe try to get familiar somehow with a defect, like uh, especially the phenol and how sensitive you are, because it turns out that genetically we are different uh, to the phenol sensitivity. And if you want to be a Q grader, you have to find that damn phenol. You know? <laughs> and yeah. also, don't skip cups, which I did. Uh, and that's why I failed. I kind of forgot about that. Or maybe I was, you know, there's always many people. And I have to say I got cocky because I did very well. You know, I did very well on, the, on exams until the very last one. And I was like, oh, I just taste this one, that one. You know, we already had a phenol before. They will not do that again. Oh, they, they did it. And it was there. You know, I was also angry that it was there. So f familiarizing with yourself with a uh, defect. And it's very hard because most of the coffees nowadays, they don't have defects. Right, right. If you buy specialty coffee, it's really rare that you'll find a defect in that. Right. Tasting. Yeah, many times, you know, like over ferment. For me, it's other thing like I these days, there are so many coffees I would grade as over ferment, but people are like, oh no, these are amazing, they're so fruity. But on a queue, you probably will mark it as over ferment, I guess. Right, yeah. I mean, I remember that from our courses that was that a lot of people were actually taking that over fermented defect and like scoring it higher because they were like, this is so, this tastes like fruit from like this country or whatever. And so that was really interesting to see. So here is. My tip for that, if you if you get an over ferment in your five cups, there will be one cup which has over ferment. The rest will be not having that. So there's usually one defect per uh, sample. So yeah, yeah, it won't be in every cup. So if there is one fruity one, that means they are looking for over ferment and not a fruity nice coffee. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Awesome. Um, you know, I'm so 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 happy that you did not take the cue only for fun but you actually did something with it and uh, you and your dad you started the brand called Hoven. tell us about yes. that what is Hoven, and how how did you decide to start a brand so Hoven started after actually when we were in the in that our initial initial week in the q course um the instructor boot willem boot he mentioned the problem about you know not having enough young farmers in the industry and the average age of a coffee farmer being older than 50. So around like 55. And I kind of took that to heart because I was like, I kind of related to that as a young person and seeing how maybe a young person might not be interested in coming into the coffee industry. And so we took that and we wanted to support young farmers in a way that would make the coffee industry more attractive for them. So um, Hoven buys coffee that is scores 84 or higher from young farmers ages 35 or younger so that we can um, you know, pay high prices to these young farmers so that they can actually make this, make their coffee farming into the, a career so that they wanna stay there instead of doing something else. So that's that's our main goal. And we try to provide sustainability in a sense by like making sure that there's high quality coffee, but that it's also produced by young farmers. Awesome. That problem is very familiar to me. I'm originally from Slovakia and 1989, we changed from communism to democracy. And obviously it's not like magic wand and everything is, is, is different. We had a long time to kind of 
uh, change the economy, change the political system, etc., etc. And one of the consequences what we got with this amazing economical development is that farmers, you know, especially the young people, they they didn't want to do that anymore. They wanted to work for you know the new startups, or they wanted to work for Amazon or Ford or. Volkswagen, whoever is in, in Slovakia, you know, they abandoned farms and they abandoned vineyards. I bought my vineyard in 2004 for thousand dollars because the guy, the guy said that, look, nobody else wants it. So just please, please take it. You know, I was like, okay. I was, and I think that that's the same happening in Central America now or other places in the world where, you know, the economy is kind of picking up. These, these countries are getting richer and young people don't want to do that. I think that might be a situation when it's not even the global warming, but exactly what you're doing now would be the cause of, you know, less coffee on the world. Do you work already with farmers and how do you how do you find these farmers? So we work with two groups of young farmers right now. And we're, obvi- we're of course, looking for um, more groups of young farmers to work with. But right now we have two, one from Kauka. Um, it's the, the Cafe Norte young producers program and then also a group of young women from Burundi who worked together to invest in their own coffee mill and so then they're um we buy coffee from them and from the group in Colombia and we found the we found the group in Burundi because we had already bought coffee from a green coffee source um, it's uh, Janine, Janine from JNP. Yeah. And she, and so we already had bought coffee from her. And so my dad called her and asked her, do you have any youth programs or any young people that we can work with? And she had this group of young women. So we bought coffee from them. And um, you can probably say better how we found the Columbia. Columbia group because you did more of that. Sure. The Q grader that, Frankie mentioned earlier, who really helped, you know, our, our initial, he helped form our initial quality control program um, is David Poole, who uh, Valerian, you know, through boot. Right. And so he was introduced to me by Helen Russell from Equator. And so I'm, I'm forever grateful to Helen for all the great advice she's given me over the years, but also for the introduction to David. And David works with Coffee for Peace as well. And so Coffee for Peace uh, was was pretty instrumental to helping us find this this group of young farmers from Cafe Norte. And and Coffee for Peace is, you know, funded by US aid. And so it's all kind of it all worked together to help us help connect us with this group. Mm-hmm. I blame uh, David Poole for my craziness about specialty coffee. <laughs> in 2002, I was doing copying Starbucks in Dark Rose. And when I came to the United States, I visited Equator. They had some tasting or cupping or something. And David was there. He was still, I think he was the director of coffee. He's a Dark Rose drink, drinker at that time. With, you know, Equator does all kind of coffee. So they do dark, they do medium, they do specialty. And, you know, we tasted coffee with my dad. He was visiting me at that time. And he he had these. Uh, uh, he asked on the end, like, you know, what do people, what do you guys think about this coffee? Which one did you like? And people answered. And he was very excited about my opinion because I told him that I'm a roaster from Eastern Europe or Central Europe. And I said, well, you know, I liked that one. And it was, I think, it was dark roast Sumatra or something like that. And he said, okay, is there something you didn't like? I was like. I really hated this one. I think that there is a defect in it because it was all funky. And that was mm-hmm. a beautiful uh, Ethiopia, Irgachev, uh, floral, jasmine, you name it, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, actually, that's our most expensive coffee. And I was like, wait, what's this about this most expensive coffee? And then I started to experiment with that and I discovered, you know, that, okay, I see why people drink uh, light roast. And it changed my whole world. So David is the one who kind of kicked my butt that in that direction. So big kudos to him. I'm sure he did it very gracefully too. He's like the kindest person ever. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, he, he, I don't think he, he, I don't think he knows this story, by the way. So, you know, I met him like once or twice after that on specialty coffee events and stuff like that. But I don't know, uh, maybe next time I meet him, I'll tell him this story because it is interesting. I mean, 
you know, I love sure. it when people come to me and they tell me that, hey, man, I started a coffee roasting company because of your podcast and I'm doing great. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm super proud. I f it feels great, you know, <laughs> so I should tell him and I meet him next time. Okay, back to your company. I have so many questions. First of okay. all, do you communicate with these young people? Uh, yeah, we have done um, a, we've done a couple of Zoom calls, like communicating directly with them. Um, or with the people from Colombia, we have done a couple Zoom calls. And you met them. Um, and also we went there, we went to Colombia in person as a trip, my father and I, um, and, a little, and a group of people, including David. And um, so that was a great experience because we met kind of the leaders of the group of the program who told us a lot about the program. And then we also met some of the young farmers who were part of the program and they brought their coffee and we cupped it. And it was, uh, it was a really fun, a really fun trip. And it was really cool to actually meet them in person and to know that they were excited about this thing that we were going to do with their coffee. Um, and then the Burundi group, we have, uh, we haven't been able to do, we haven't been able to travel there. Um, and then we weren't able to do any Zoom calls because the connection between here and Burundi is not um, not great. Or so we did some videos though, where we sent a video of um, telling them about our excitement and about what we're, we were doing, and then they sent a video back. So we've had like minimal communication with the Burundi group, but a lot of communication with the Columbia group. I love it. That's really awesome. That's really cool. Uh, what do you think is the main motivator of young coffee farmers? Is it the money or is it more a recognition and perhaps fame? I think that I think that a lot of them are driven by passion because they really, really love to farm coffee. And I've heard stories, at least when we went to Colombia, a lot of the farmers were telling us that they really enjoyed it and they wanted to do it. A lot of them were worried about money, though. And so I think that is probably the second biggest concern is they're, I mean, you know, they're worried about money and they want to make sure that they can actually make a living and that they can um, provide for themselves and maybe families later or if they have families now. And so um, I think that they're very passionate about it, but they also want to ensure that they'll be able to make that living. So I think they're both important. And I think that that's why, you know, we're here to support them. And yeah. yeah. Who do you think are your customers now in the United States? Uh, who are the people this message resonate with? I think mostly right now, um, it's a lot of coffee people who already know about the problem and a lot of people who like good quality coffee. Um, and also people, and also on the other hand, there are people that don't maybe know much about coffee, but they're really excited about the cost-based idea of Hoven, and they're excited to learn more about coffee. Um, I'm. It's mostly a lot of adults right now. There's not a lot of like young people in my age that want to buy it because they're not that into high quality coffee. They're more into like Starbucks drinks or whatever. But um, I think that I, uh, yeah, mostly adults, and so and I've seen a good balance of coffee loving people who already know a lot about coffee and also people who don't know maybe much about coffee but they'd like to learn more and would like to support something that is a cause based well that raises my question how can you do that i mean you are still going to school right how can you juggle school and know that you have after school activities and starting a coffee brand well thankfully i have a lot of people who are helping me so my dad and i we I would like, I think of us as more of like partners with Hoven because we both do a lot of work for Hoven. And, um, you know, while he works, he does the Shul and Sparrows, he helps out with Hoven. And all of the Hoven like production is done in the same facility as Shul and Sparrows. So it's nice that we already have roasters to use and we have the space. So it's not like we don't have space. So we have the space to, you know, package the coffee and sell it. Um, so that's nice that we have that. And then also there's a team of people from that already work at Sparrows and Shul, Sparrows and Shul that are also helping to um, taste the Hoven coffee. So I'll, we'll do, do cuppings with multiple people whenever we are tasting like a new harvest of Hoven or a new coffee we're looking at. And then um, that we have 
production people that will work for Shul that also help out with the production of um, the roasting and packaging of Hoven. So uh, I help out as much as I can, but when I'm at school or extracurriculars or wherever, there are people that can um, help out and kind of move things along. So that's really nice. And, and thankfully my school is pretty flexible because they've let me miss school for like um, a couple interviews for things like this. They'll let me miss school so that I can, um, as long as I keep my, you know, my studies up, I can balance both pretty well. So wait, you don't have to do uh, packaging and labeling? I, I try to help out and do that as much as I can. And um, our bags, yeah, and I do that whenever I have time. But we also, some people help me out with that too when I don't have time. For that. Not fair. I'm doing it all the time. And that's probably my least uh, thing I like about the whole coffee world, packaging and labeling. Ugh, I really hate that. Not fair. Because <laughs> I, I want it to be fair. I want to try to do some of that labor so that I'm not just like, doing the interviews and talking about it and then not helping out with any of the stuff. So I try to do as much of that as I can as well. No, I'm messing with you. You know, you, then you get in trouble like I did and I am figuring out, okay, what do I have to toss away from my life and focusing on things what matters. I think that for you focusing on the mission itself and spreading the word is super important. You, you think it smarter than I did. <laughs> so I fall into the packaging and labeling by my own fault. I'm asking for my entrepreneur daughter because she, she f always feels that she wants to start something and she always wants to earn money. As a teenager, what would be your advice how you should go about it when you want to start a business? I would tell her that she shouldn't have to feel super rushed into like starting her own thing um and that if she feels like i have to do it because like i need to get a quick start um that you know it, i think she should just um she should take her time in the sense that if she finds something that she's really passionate about like i am about coffee then go ahead and like do the best that you can with the resources that you have and even if it's just like a something really small and Maybe you're only selling to neighbors or if you're like, you know, trying to start your own babysitting business or like baking and you just do in your little neighborhood or you um, are like on Instagram and you only have a couple people each week that order from you or whatever. That can that's a great start because as long as she's doing something that she's passionate about, that is something that is really cool. And I know that as young people. Usually we don't have as many resources as adults and we don't have as much experience. Like thankfully for thankfully for me, I my dad had already has already worked in coffee um, for like a couple years before I even wanted to do this whole coffee thing. So he already had a lot of resources that I could also use and that we could use for Hoven. But if you don't have any resources or you're starting from like absolutely nothing, it can be really hard. So I just think that as long as she's doing something that she's passionate about and as long as she uh, keeps working at it, she'll gain experience in it and she can have fun and it doesn't need to blow up right away and it, she can just work on it for, for as long as she needs to. I also want to ask you about your motivation, why you do this. Is it uh, money, fame, passion, something else? And I want you to be 100% honest. I think it's definitely passion because I am very excited about coffee and I'm also really excited about helping people. And that's one of the things that I've always wanted to do. Um, even when I didn't know anything about coffee is I always said, I want to do something that can help somebody. I can, I want to do something that can help somebody that has less than me that doesn't have the opportunities that I have. So I think that it's really nice that I was able to be in the right place at the right time and take this, course and become a Q grader and then use that to and the resources that I have to help these young farmers and attempt to solve and raise awareness of this problem that could be really crucial to the coffee industry. So I think that passion is definitely my main motivation. Um, but I also think that um, that money is important too and not for just for me. Uh, I don't really care that much how much money I make because I consider success with how like happy I am and how excited I am about doing what I am doing but just that it's important that we um 
make a lot of money with Hoven so that we can continue supporting these young farmers and expand Hoven to support a lot more young farmers. So what, what would you spend your money on? Let's say Hoven is doing very well. What would be your first little reward to yourself that you're doing great? Um, a reward to myself. That's a good question. I think that I would probably, well, I think that one of the things I've been really wanting for a while is a, like a puppy, but um, <laughs> I don't know if that's really practical. So I don't know if I would spend my money on that, but I think that um, at least right now, the more money that we make with Hoven, the more that we can use it to invest in more young farmers. So I think that's probably the most important thing right now. And um, any other little things are less important, but maybe if they um, come, then that's exciting too. Again, asking for my daughter, how to manage dad and moms when let's say you get into conflict with them in your business? Um, I think so far I haven't really gotten into a lot of conflict with them, but at least when I'm working with my dad, I think that most of the time I just, since I'm his daughter, it's easy for me. I think it's easier for me to just say, I want you to if listen to me. If I feel like um, I want to like give him an idea or something, I feel like it's, I don't think I'm not like scared of him as like a boss or something where I'm like, I don't know if he'll listen to me. I just kind of tell him this is my dad. And I say, I, this is my idea. I want you to listen to it. But um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that a lot of our like household disagreements really interfere with the business part as much. Um, and we haven't really had much conflict yet. So hopefully that doesn't happen very much in the future. I was hoping for some tips like fake crying or, or puppy <laughs> eyes or something like that. Well, I guess that could work too, but that's not usually the approach I take. I usually just kind of, I don't know. I usually just say, listen to me. Oh, okay. That, that's a tip. Listen to me. <laughs> that's what my daughter does. And then I feel sad. I also want to know what are your next plans? Like, uh, where do you see Hoven in, let's say, the next 12 months? And where do you see it in five years? I think for both, I mean, for at least for the next 12 months, we're always just, we're always looking for new partnerships that we can make with young farmers. We want to, first of all, make sure that People know about this problem, so we want to make Hoven as known as possible by getting on the news and have just having more people hear about it. So that's where we're going short term. We want more pe more and more people to hear about it, and then long term in five years, you know, we're just we just want to have have relationships with a lot of young farmers. We want to have Hoven be. I mean, we just want Hoven to be larger, you know, and extend to a lot of different countries and a lot of different communities. Um, and also extend to a lot of different people so that they might be willing to participate in solving this problem or maybe starting their own coffee that can help with the problem as well. Tim, I have a question for you. How does it feel to have entrepreneurial daughter? It's, it's cool. It's cool. I mean, it's really fun for us to work on this together because there's, you know, she's 14 and she's she she's pretty easy to be honest as a child like she's well behaved and um she, she's made our lives easy in that regard but it's just it's just it's great to have something to connect on like just something substantive because you know it's not that if you don't have something like this you can't have a good relationship but it's definitely elevated ours and it's given us um a good excuse to like take trips together and spend time together like just her and me like we have other we have two other kids and I, I have things with those two as well but it's, it's just neat to have something really specific with one of your kids do you, do you have any tips for us with kids who have this kind of entrepreneurial urge yeah definitely I would say encourage it because it's special if they if they have that inclination when they're young that's that's not very typical and so that's i think it's cool to, to celebrate that and i guess i don't know what we're what i'm trying to figure out with frankie is the balance between you know having her really focused on this but also having her focused on her life outside of this and there's a really good chance that she's gonna 
do well with this and bring a lot of awareness to this issue and Hoven's going to grow more and that's all great. But then maybe she wants to be like an orthodontist um, later in life and that's cool too. So, uh, you know, I don't want to be too prescriptive in like this doesn't have to be her life. Like it can be if she wants it to be, but she's also totally free to, to do something different. Awesome. Frankie, I go through my end questions. You know what's coming. If I would give you $10,000, which by the way, I will not give you, but if I would have give you, what, what kind of business would you start? Well, if you're, if I'm speaking coffee related, I would definitely use that 10 K to invest more in Hoban because I think that, um, just anything that we can use to grow that will just really help. And I think I'm very passionate about the whole cause based thing and about helping somebody. So I think that that is what I would invest that in. If you're talking not business, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think that, I mean, not, not, not business, not coffee. I think that I would, yeah, I think right now I would definitely just use it for Hoban. I think that I don't know what I would do besides that right now with it. I'd probably, it's only, the only thing I would do that is invest in Hoban right now. And then, I don't know, maybe in the future, if you ask me the same question, it'd be a different answer. But Let's elaborate on the Hoban because that's cool. I want to spend $10,000 there. So what would you do with the $10,000 in Hoban? Um, I would probably use it to... Uh, well, I would find another youth program that is, um, that has youth people that are making coffee. Um, and then I would buy, I would use that 10 K or maybe one or two or multiple. And I would use that 10 K to buy coffee from them and then sell it again. And, um, yeah, that's what I would use it for. Awesome. That sounds, that sounds good. That sounds great. Do you have any question for me? What is like your favorite experience you've had in coffee or maybe one of the coolest people you've met or um, one of the coolest things that's happened to you in coffee? Oh boy. <laughs> Next time I will ask these questions. <laughs> well, first, you know, two things come to my mind. One, how did I get to coffee? That, that, that was a pretty interesting story. You know, I'm a political scientist and in my beginning of my career, I was working with human rights and I was uh, lucky enough to go to Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina to work as a human rights officer for an organization called Organization Sec for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And in Kosovo, we were on the umbrella of United Nations. So I was there as a human rights officer and I met this American woman. By the way, I was never in the United States before. I was doing my work in Central Europe. I was traveled through Europe, but not the United States. And my colleague, I met my colleague and we usually, she usually always commented on, on the coffee we had in the office. And to be honest, to be frank, that coffee was a, just a big, cheap mass brand, um, European, I think a Swedish mass brand called Gevalia. And nothing like, it's pretty bad. I think it's even mixed with Robusta, but she always commented on that. And as a European with uh, my kind of like pr European pride for uh, foodie food stuff, I was like, how can American criticize uh, American coffee, uh, European coffee? So I was always kind of like, you know, we got into this little conflict. And then she, one day she told me, you know what? I'll bring you a coffee from United States. The company is called Starbucks. And again, it's 1999, 9, 2000, 2001. So it's a long time ago. And I was like, fine. So she brought me, uh, first of all, she brought me Sumatra. And that was the first shocker. It's like, there are coffees which are from countries, from origin. I mean, all you can get in Europe is just blends. You can get the yellow blend, you can get the green blend, red blend, but not coffee from Sumatra or some, some concrete country. So I was Wow, that was very fascinating. I loved that aspect of it. The second thing is it was dark roast. And because all these European cheap coffees were roasted light roast, and the reason was not because of the quality, but because of the weight loss, they were pretty acidic and not good. And this dark roast was a very different taste profile. And I just, you know, I just love that there's coffee, which is very, very different. So I fall in love with that concept and I started to look for it. And I said, yes, 
you American woman, her name is Katie, and she's my wife today. Um, we, you know, I gave her right that that coffee is better than what we are drinking in that place. And that started my whole curiosity about coffee, about the place, about the origin. And that's how I started with coffee. So I don't know. Is, is that a good answer? Yeah, that's great. That's a really cool story. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I like to tell this story because it's funny. And by the way, the name Green Plantation uh, was born in a bathtub. Uh, that's my company in Slovakia. I started it like when we came back to um, to uh, Europe. We lived in Budapest. It's the capital of Hungary. And uh, one day in the bath, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a company. And my wife was like, you know what? I think Green Plantation is a great name. So my wife is not involved in my businesses at all. She <laughs> doesn't like business. She finds this business a little bit kind of like, I don't know, weird. But she was a decision maker in so many things when it comes to the my coffee career. So that's kind of funny. Oh, that's really cool. All right, Frankie, where can people find more information about uh, Holman? Um, the best place you can find the coffee and more information is hovencoffee.com, J-O-V-E-N-C-O-F-F-E-E dot C-O-M. Okay. Thank you. And they can also follow me, follow me on Instagram at kidqgrader, K-I-D-Q-G-R-A-D-E-R. I love that handle. That's awesome. <laughs> I will put everything into the show notes. So if you go to coffeeis.me, you will find the article to this podcast and you will find all the links so people can find you very easily. Well, Frankie, good luck with your project. That sounds great. And by the way, good luck. You know, recently I was watching a lot of French TV shows and I don't speak French, but one thing stuck to me stuck to me that they don't say good luck but they say bon courage which means have a lot of courage so have a lot of courage you're doing a great thing and yeah bye thank you so much thanks